All right, guys, what we want to do now is illustrate the different types of risk preferences. All right, and now some people are risk seeking, but those tend to be the exception to the rules. So you got a guy who's going to swim in the ocean. There's a huge shark in there. And this guy's got a big smile. Well, they seek out risk. Well, really in the real world, not practical. Risk seeking, honestly, what that means is if you bought an investment that exposes you to a, a lot of risk, Rather than increasing your required rate of return, somebody who's risk-seeking would actually reduce their required rate of return because they're such a thrill-seeker. So that is rare, probably zero. Next to nobody's going to be risk-seeking when it comes to financial investments. Most of us on the other side are what we call risk-averse. All right, so if you're going to get in the ocean and there's a shark swimming around, you certainly want to be in a steel cage, no doubt. So risk averse, that means in investing that whenever we take on risk, we want to be compensated for it. So the more risk we feel we're being exposed to, that increases our required rate of return. And we covered that with cost of capital. So whenever you're exposed to greater risk, you're going to increase your required rate of return. In between risk seeking and risk averse, I mean, kind of risk neutral, risk indifferent, All righty. So, you know, if you're indifferent with respect to risk, generally those are investors who just seek out the highest possible rate of return, regardless of the risk that they have to assume. Okay. So those people are considered risk indifferent. All right, guys. Now we want to be able to identify the different types of risk, interest rate risk. What is interest rate risk? Well, if you buy a bond, And anytime you buy a bond, invest in a bond, well, you're really a lender. And if it's a fixed rate bond, what's interest rate risk? You run the risk that if interest rates go up, the value of your investment goes down. If newly issued debt with the exact same credit rating is now paying a higher rate, no one's going to want your bond unless you discount the price. So interest rate risk is the risk that you've invested in a bond, fixed rate, and that interest rates are going to go up and the value of your bond would go down. Okay, remember market risk due to macroeconomic factors that's non-diversifiable risk. So if you put your money in the stock market, let's say you just buy the S&P, all right? And whatever the risk-free rate is, well, you better tack on to that a market risk premium. Because you can't diversify away this risk, and in the U.S., if we said the risk-free rate with long-term bonds, let's say, was 2%, and then let's say, historically, the average return on the stock market was, let's say, 7%, the difference between the 7 and the 2, that's called a market risk premium. And the reason why we're going to demand that market risk premium is because due to macroeconomic factors, you put your money in the market, you can't diversify this away. So entice people... To entice investors to put their money in the market, they get that market risk premium, or at least that's what they hope for. Okay, now market risk is different from diversifiable risk. That's company-specific risk. That's due to that individual company's specific degree of operating leverage or financial leverage or the volatility they have in their own sales or the risk they might have in losing market share, whatever it may be. So whenever you have a risk that's unique to a particular company or industry, the goal is to put together a portfolio of assets that are relatively uncorrelated so that you can diversify away that risk. So that's why in portfolio management, if you ever want to go on and sit for the CFA when you're done with the CPA, but portfolio managers look to diversify away risk because theoretically, risk that could have been eliminated through diversification, you're not going to get rewarded for assuming risk that could have been diversified. So we generally look to put together a diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, alternative investments like real real estate, et cetera, and to try to diversify away risk. Okay, now credit risk, you're looking at your own credit rating. Okay, so when we assess credit risk, a company, a corporation is looking at their own credit rating and they're trying to determine, hey, what happens if our credit rating gets downgraded? Well, if your credit rating gets downgraded, what's going to happen to your cost of borrowing now? It's going to go up. So if you issued variable rate debt historically, well, now that interest rate on that variable rate debt would go up if your credit rating goes down. So credit risk looks at a issuer's, a corporation's cost of borrowing as it's related to their credit rating. General rule of thumb, the better your credit rating, the lower the cost of borrowing and vice versa. Okay, default risk. Now, you know, if you want to extend credit, let's say to a customer, you know, what's their probability that they're going to default and not make those payments to you when they become due? So when you determine your credit policy, your default risk is really what you're looking at. So if you're going to extend credit to a customer and you want to determine, well, number one, is that customer credit worthy? And then number two, what should their cost of borrowing be? A lot of that is based upon assessing their default risk. 
So we look at that risk of distress, their current ratio, their working capital, their quick ratio, cash conversion cycle. But is that customer making enough money, enough cash to pay you the money they owe you on time? So that risk of default. Okay, liquidity risk. Well, liquidity risk is when you decide to not invest in publicly traded stocks and bonds. So for example, if you limit your portfolio to publicly traded stocks and bonds, well, those securities are inherently very liquid. If you want to sell that stock, you own stock in IBM or Microsoft, off, you make a phone call and you're not going to have to significantly discount the price to sell it quickly. Okay, so that's the advantage of owning publicly traded stocks. The disadvantage of owning publicly tra traded stocks though is that the probability of them being mispriced is slim and none because when McDonald's and Facebook and all these companies are followed by investors all over the world, it's much more likely it would be efficiently priced. With alternative investments like real estate, that's where you have liquidity risk. I mean, so the probability if growth grandma goes to sell her house tomorrow, the probability that her house is efficiently priced is much lower because it's not publicly traded. That's the good news. You might be able to find a good bargain in real estate. The bad news is with real estate, it's illiquid. So if you buy real estate and you need to sell it quickly because the asset is illiquid, you may have to discount the price sharply to be able to sell that asset quickly. Okay, that's liquidity risk. Okay, price risk. What do they mean by price risk? Okay, so price risk could be looked at one of two ways. The fair market value, let's say we invest in something, a trading security or available for sale that's being marked to fair market value, price risk would then be the risk that, hey, if the market value goes down, the price of this asset goes down, we're going to have to record a loss on our income statement. Or if you sell it, price risk, what's the risk that the selling price goes down in the future and then you'd have less sales revenue. Now there's ways to hedge price risk, right? If you own an asset and you're worried about that price going down in the future, future well, you can hedge that risk. You might be able to sell forward or futures contracts or buy a put option. So if the price does go down, you could use the profit on the derivative to offset your lower selling price. Okay, but price risk, so whenever you have ownership of an asset and you're worried about that price going down, you've invested in an asset, you're going to have to find a way to hedge that risk. And remember, there's exchange rate risk. I mean, if you got a receivable denominated in a foreign currency, what's your risk? The foreign currency goes down in value. Well, we're going to have to find a way to hedge that risk. Okay, so that's an excellent review of the terminology. So now let's take a look at an example with uh, math. 